Good morning. I am Dr. Vidya, working as a consultant at the Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Department, Shankaroy Hospital, Bangalore. Today, I am going to talk about the ocular features in albinism. This is the overview of my topic. So, I'll be going through the definition, prevalence, etiology, classification, syndromes, clinical approach, evaluation, and the management. The word albinism is originated from the Latin word albus, meaning white. Albinism is a set of inherited conditions characterized by absent or decreased tissue melanin in conjunction with the characteristic ocular and the visual pathway anomalies. According to various studies, the global incidence is about 1 in 20,000. The highest rates of incidence have been recorded in Panama and Colombia. There are no reports of prevalence in Indian subcontinent. So the causative is mainly the deficiency or the absence of tyrosinase activity, abnormal melanocyte differentiation, any dysfunctional synthesis or transport of melanin within the cells. All these things can lead to this inherited condition. So phenotypically, it is divided into two types, the ocular cutaneous albinism and the ocular albinism. Ocular cutaneous albinism involves varying degrees of involvement of the eyes, hair, and the skin. Ocular albinism, the involvement is limited to the eyes alone. The ocular cutaneous albinism is divided into two types, the non-syndromic and the syndromic type. The non-syndromic is further divided into seven subtypes based on gene sequencing. The syndromic type is further divided into hermansky pudlak syndrome, Wardenberg syndrome, Chidaki-Gachi syndrome, Grizzly syndrome, and LHLD syndrome. So the ocular cutaneous albinism, it's an autosomal recessive condition associated with a mutation in several enzymes or membrane proteins that contribute to melanin synthesis. So during this pathway, wherever the enzymes are deficient, Depending on that, the subtypes of OCA is divided further. So these are the various subtypes of oculocutaneous albinism and the locus where the genetic mutation occurs. So ocular albinism is divided into two types. It is a type one and the type two. Type one is also known as a little ship falls uh, ocular albinism. It is commonly found to have an X-linked recessive inheritance. It's a most common form of ocular albinism. The mutation is found in the GPR143 gene. It is usually associated with the late onset sensory neural deafness. The carrier females can present with a mud splatter fundus. The ocular albinism type 2, also known as the Allen Island eye disease, it has an excellent inheritance. The clinical features of uh, the ocular, ocular albinism type 2 has the same as that of ocular albinism type 1. Along with that, there are the features of proton color defect, dark adaptation anomalies too. The female carriers here don't exhibit the characteristic fundus pattern as seen in the type 1 patients. Here, the clinical features overlap with the congenital stationary night blindness. The syndromic forms. We know now that the oculocutaneous albinism is defined by the defect in the monanin production. Various syndromic forms have the defects in the packing and the trafficking of the cellular proteins. First is the hermansky pudlak syndrome. Here it is an autosomal recessive disorder associated with a bleeding tendency due to the platelet storage deficiency, along with the interstitial lung disease and the granulomatous colitis. Albinoidism. It has an autosomal dominant inheritance. It is an intermediate phenotype between, between the wild type and the true albinism. Usually the children have the normal vision, retinal development, and no nystagmus. Wardenbach syndrome, it is an autosomal dominant disorder. As shown in this picture, there will be patchy areas of hypopigmentation of the hair and the skin. Conjunctal deafness is found in 20% cases. Silvery hair syndrome, it's an intermediate form of hypopigmentation. It is also an autosomal recessive condition. So under this comes the Chirakigachi syndrome, Grizzly syndrome, and the Elijalde syndrome. So the Chirakigachi and the Grizzly syndrome both have the, uh, have the children with recurrent infections. It's because of the inherited, inherited immune defects in these children. The, all the three syndromes have the neurological impairment too. 
So coming to the clinical features in albinism, first comes the iris translimination defects, which are very classical in these children. It is mainly due to the absent or deficient melanin in the posterior pigment epithelium, which will lead on to the blue or light brown iris. Because of this develops the symptoms of glare in the photophobia. Then the pendular nystagmus. There will be a rhythmic involuntary conjugate eye movements. Usually it starts at around two to three months of age as large amplitude nystagmus, which slowly turns into this pendular pattern with the time. So in this video, you can see the horizontal uh, involuntary conjugate eye movements. You can see the pendular movements here. Foveal hypoplasia, it's universal in all types of albinism. It is mainly due to the poor foveal development due to inappropriate retinal pigment epithelial pigmentation. The degree of hypoplasia usually correlates with the visual acuity. So here you can see the, the fundus with absent foveal reflex, which is classical feature of a foveal hypoplasia. And when we do an OCT and OCT, you, you will not be able to see the foveal pit here. The foveal depression will be absent. And with the opta, that is the OCT angiography, there will be small non-existent or non-existent foveal avascular zone with the vessels crossing through the fovea. The directional OCT studies have shown the reduction in the outer nuclear layer thickness and increase in the Henley's fiber layer the latter attributed to the increase in the foveal bone packing. Fundus examination is usually characterized by the enhanced visualization of the deeper corridor vessels due to the hypopigmented fundus. And there can be associated features of an optic nerve hypoplasia, which are characterized by small nerves with the abnormal shape, orientation, vessel origin, and peripapillary course. The albinism can also be associated with the situs inverses and the nasally directed artery. Abnormal visual pathway decussation is classical in patients with the albinism. Normally, the, the nerve fibers originating from the temporal retina, as shown in this picture, project onto the ipsilateral and from the nasal retina goes to the contralateral hemisphere. In children with albinism, Majority, that is 90% of the fibers, decussate to the contralateral hemisphere. This is detected by three lead VEP. In albinism, the monocular VEPs hence show a bilateral contralateral predominance. The, the dominant response is elicited in the cortical hemisphere, opposite to the eye being stimulated. And when the other eye is stimulated, the dominant response is elicited in the other hemisphere which is called as a crossed asymmetry. Here you can see with the right eye stimulation, the right hemisphere may not show the response, but it is nicely shown in the left hemisphere. It is vice versa in the left eye. This is called as a contrary sorry, crossed asymmetry. The fractal errors are very common in these children. Hyperopia is more pronounced than the myopia as per various studies. And with the rule, astigmatism is very common. Significant changes in astigmatism is detected in the first decade of life. The near vision is often better than the distant vision. Strabismus is pronounced in about 50% of the patients with uh, uh, albinism. Nearly 100% of OCA type 1 patients present with the strabismus. Alphabet patterns are also commonly reported. So clinical assessment, it starts with a multidisciplinary approach. So first we have to assess the skin hypopigmentation and we have to take protective measures to prevent further complications because of the hypopigmentation. Then we have to exclude the systemic involvement in the form of a bleeding susceptibility, recurrent infections, breathing difficulties, which are all common with the syndromic association. Then we have to look in for the refraction, assessment of the nystagmus, orthoptic assessment, VEP, OCT, and the genetic testing. So refraction always, a cycloplegic refraction need to be done, and the prompt correction of the refractive error is mandatory. The frequent visits are required in the first decade of life. Assessment of nystagmus and the abnormal head posture. 
So we have to evaluate for the axis of oscillation, conjugacy, frequency, and amplitude. Video-based eye, eye movement recordings can also be used. Here in this picture, you can see the child is reading with the head tilt and the face turn, which gets corrected with the, uh, with the glasses. Orthoptic evaluation. So the cover does need to be performed with and without correction to look in for the strabismus. And we have to evaluate the ductions and versions in all the nine cardinal positions of case. Visual above potential. It's a recommended method uh, being the multi-channel pattern reversal VEP, which gives the accurate results. The typical crossed asymmetry, as we discussed already, it's mainly will lead on to the chiasmal. Uh, this is due to the chiasmal misrouting on monocular VEP. This is done if there is a suspicion of albinism and in children, if clinical signs are unclear. OCT, the Thomas and co-workers have standardized a system to describe the degrees of hypoplasia. Iris OCT can also be used as a potential diagnostic tool. So this is the grading given by Thomas and co-workers. Genetic testing, confirm the clinical suspicion in children with a poor cooperation. We have to rule out other disorders due to the phenotypic overlap. Next generation sequencing is better than the traditional Sanger sequencing. Treatment strategies. So first comes the refractive error correction, wrong correction of the error with the glasses to prevent the amblyopia. Magnification devices like telescope and magnifiers can be used to help the children with a reduced visual acuity. Occlusion therapy, if there is features of amblyopia, and in the presence of a manifest latent nystagmus with a moderate amblyopia, atropin, atropin penalization can be tried. Nystagmus, we are management should try to reduce the intensity of the nystagmus, lengthen the foveation period in null zone, correct the abnormal head posture. So various surgical strategies are available. Depending on the type of the nystagmus, we can select the strategies. The alternative strategies for nystagmus, mainly the pharmacological agents, the gabapentin, mamantin have been tried. Carbonic anhydrous inhibitors have been tried. Contact lens use have also been tried to increase the foveation time and reduce the intensity of the nystagmus. So these children usually have the glare in the photophobia. So to reduce the glare, the neutral gray fixed tinted glasses with a light transmission factor of 20% will help them out. Modified tinted soft contact lenses to imitate the artificial iris can also be used. Black diaphragm eye wall implantation during cataract surgery will help them out from this photophobia. The prosthetic iris implants without a central lens can also be used. Novel therapies, L-DOPA. So it has been hypothesized, hypothesized that the exogenous L-DOPA may aid in postnatal retinal maturation. Lee and co-workers have suggested that L-DOPA supplementation during postnatal therapeutic window could rescue developing retina. Netizenone, it's an FDA approved drug for hereditary tyrosinemia type 1. It is supposed to block the tyrosine degradation and thus postulated to be beneficial in OCA patients. Pilot study in five patients of OCA 1B showed no clinical but statistical improvement in the visual acuity. Gene based therapies are upcoming. The delivery of OA1 gene encapsulated by the adeno associated virus vectors delivered subretinally have been tried in mice. So the gene based therapy is in. Um, TYR gene has also been tried on animal models. So conclusion, the treatment is to be focused on managing the clinical features and the possible sequelae, improving the nystagmus and optimizing vision by correcting the refractive error and reducing the glare is very important in these children. Preclinical models and early treatment trials have shown promise at targeting the biochemical pathway to improve the bio, uh, melanin's biosynthesis. I acknowledge Dr. Sahil and Dr. Nishant for helping me out in preparing this presentation. Thank you.